Welcome to Transformation Talks, the podcast where we sit down with coaches, thought leaders, creatives, and more to get their insight on the two lessons that changed their lives and might change yours too. We are your co-hosts, Latina twin filmmakers Adrian and Andrew Nuno. We are on a journey to growth and self-development, and we'd like to take you along for the ride. So let's dig in and get real. And we are so, so, so excited to have the one and the only, the fabulous Erica Cruz with us today. So excited. <laughs> so a little bio on Erica for those who may not know. Erica Cruz is a coach, speaker, and founder of Courage Driven Latina. Erica left a six-figure tech job and moved back into her childhood room to start her coaching business. Within 12 months, she grew her business to multi six figures from that room. She has supported hundreds of Latinas in finding clarity, living a life they love, and leading with courage. Her social media content on social media and her podcast, Chingona Revolution, helps people become the best version of themselves. Erica has been featured in the New York Times, LA Times, CNN, and Telemundo, and she is just getting started. Yeah, she is. <laughs> Erica, welcome to the show. What a fabulous introduction. You all make me feel so important. <laughs> Because <laughs> you are important, girl. Absolutely. You are. Absolutely. <laughs> but thank you so much for coming on the show. You are our first guest. Yeah. Um, and we couldn't be more excited to have you on, uh, especially with sharing your story and the lessons that you have to share with us. So thank you again so, so much for coming on. Yeah, and thank you for having me. What an honor. When I learned I was your first guest, I was like... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're so, so excited. Um, we couldn't think of a more fitting first guest for Transformation Talks, um, especially not only since you're going to, I remember when we first met you, you were in a very different place in life and you went through such a massive transformation and now you get to help others transform their lives. And so, yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember, I believe when we first met you, you were still working your tech job yeah. and you were thinking about starting your coaching business and I, I feel I feel like a proud parent, just like I was there with you since the very beginning when you first <laughs> we saw the idea, like the inception, plant, the inception of the idea planted in you, and now to see where you've gone with it is just like, oh my gosh, it's like it's such an honor um, to to be a witness to it. And so, one of the things that I figure we would dive into first is you talking about. Leading with courage, even when you're afraid. Because mm -hmm. I feel like that was one of the big things for you in taking this step, whether it was starting your business, calling off an engagement. And so I was wondering if you could dive into a little bit about that. Yeah. Okay. So really quick, when we, when we met, when I met Adrian and Andrew, we were all in a group coaching program where we were all students. And it was my first ever investment in myself that was outside of formal education. And I think even joining that program was an act of courage because I was terrified. I had never paid that amount of money for something that wasn't a degree or something. I had done yoga teacher training, but it was a fraction of the price. And then I got a certification at the end, right? So it, I think even just joining that was a huge act of courage. And this was also, we met in 2020. So there was so much uncertainty that was going on. And I was still living on my own in a studio in Silicon Valley. I was working in the tech industry. I was making good income, but I hated my life. And I think there was almost this level of guilt where why do I want more if I have so much more than my parents had? And there was almost this belief of why can't I just be grateful for what I have because I have so much more than what my parents had. And I think a lot of us in that container we're, we're navigating this, right, where we wanted to become the best versions of ourselves. But then we have our family and friends like, oh, no, you have a great job. And people didn't understand where we were going. So I think containers like that are just so, so important. And you both witnessed while when, yeah, I was thinking about leaving my job, the, the birth of, at then it was called Purpose Driven Latina, of the group program Purpose Driven Latina. And uh, you both also saw me kind of grow on TikTok because that's where my business kind of was built. And then I think you were both there whenever I decided I'm going to move back into my childhood room, which was such a blow to my ego. And that was also an act of courage. And that scared the heck out of me because I hadn't lived at home in 10 years. And then to come back to my mom's and it really took this moment of what matters more, 
what people's perception is of me or the mission that I'm looking to achieve. So to answer your question about courage and how the definition of courage is to do something regardless of being scared. So like to do it with fear. And I think people assume courage and bravery is something that's just, it means fearless, but it doesn't mean fearless. It means to do it with the fear. And you can't have courage without vulnerability. And you can't have courage without a risk of failure. And I think that's what makes courage so admirable and so scary at the same time. And moving back into my mom's house was this big act of courage where I was almost shedding the old identity of being this hyper independent person. And I was accepting help from somebody because I had a bigger mission in mind. And I remember I, I posted something, your dreams have to be bigger than your ego. And it, people loved it whenever whenever I, I posted that. And I think whenever you're looking to make an act of courage, ask yourself, like, what matters more, this, like, bigger picture or my ego? Mm, wow, that, oof. Yeah, I resonate yeah. with that. I resonate yeah. with that so much. And it's so funny that you said it because I just last week, uh, when we were re recording our first episode with Just Us, uh, I was reminded of a quote Adrian told me about where, uh, I forget who, who said it, but they said that, uh, when you take enough risks, you are going to fail. Now, there's a marginal chance for it. Not that it may happen. Like you are going to fail. It, and and I think that 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 kind of goes hand in hand here because it's like I feel like a lot of people are just so scared to take risks because it, it's just it's going to come crashing down on them and their ego is going to get bruised and you know they're just so scared at the idea of of failure. But the idea of like your dreams have to be bigger than your ego. Like that is, oof, I resonate with that. Yeah, so, so much. Oh, I, I also resonate with how much you talked about how just because we go and do these courageous things doesn't mean we do it fearless. We're still scared, mm -hmm. but we still push on despite that because I have so many folks who are just like, oh, people who go and give speeches or people who quit their their jobs and pursue what they love. Like they must be so fearless and 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 brave and it's like yep they could do those things but they can still be scared <laughs> yeah unbelievably like you know but the fact that they can do it despite knowing that they still have these feelings like you said be vulnerable uh with that i think that's that's something that we can all relate to and that the fact that anybody can do that that's the most important thing and to keep in mind and so um that in what you said uh really resonated with me with what you had to to share and in looks like that the risks that you have taken have have really paid off. You know, you are thriving with your coaching business, traveling all around, uh, going to conferences and workshops and speaking engagements and just living your best life, you know? Uh, and I, I just remember, again, just when you first told us you wanted to do this and now seeing you these year, all these years later doing it, it's just, I just feel so proud of you uh, and just so happy for you that you're doing this and, and you're killing it. Oh, thank you. And you know, if I may say one thing, I think you both saw me at a moment of huge transformation, right? You saw me, uh, you, you met me after a lot of failed attempts. I had a food blog before. I went through yoga teacher training and then the pandemic closed the yoga studios. So as much as it can really look like this business of mine was built overnight, it was all of the trial and error that happened before that led me to that place. So you both just saw me in this place of, oh, she's just taking action and it's and it's happening for her. And I think that in order for me to get there, I had to do the dance of hesitation and not lead with courage many times. There was many times when, for example, my food blog, I never made a dollar from it. And I ran a food blog for about two years. And that's what allowed me to show up consistently on social media. But I learned something from every failed project. And I don't even know if I'd call it a failed project, but the project that didn't manifest into a profitable business. And um, Andrew, you had talked about uh, about failure and the like the fear of failure. But it's so it's so true. What I have found inside of my group program that's now called Courage Driven Athena, everybody inside the program works on a courage project. And that courage project could be starting a business, launching a podcast, being the first in their family to go to therapy, uh, asking for a raise at work, setting boundaries with family members. I mean, it could be life or business related. It doesn't matter what they do because whatever they do, it requires courage. So 
what I found was people were getting stuck and they weren't taking action. And I was like, well, what are they afraid of? And I was like, oh, they're afraid of failure. So then I thought, well, what if I make it a goal to fail? So now we've started doing this thing called a failure challenge. We just started this round started September 1st and people and so the, everybody submits their their failure. So the rules are if there's a risk of failure and you take an action, that counts for the failure challenge. And what happens? Well, they're not failing all the time. What happens is they're taking more action. So inevitably they're getting more wins as well. And even if they do fail, we learn from the failures. We don't learn from the success. Imagine if everything in your life worked out. We don't actually learn that much from that. You know, we've heard failure is redirection and that's true. Failure teaches us what doesn't work. And that is just as valuable as what does work. So with this failure challenge, my my clients, it it motivates them. It kind of makes it a game and it it teaches them that failure doesn't actually kill us, right? Nothing bad happens when we fail. Your ego survives. You're fine. And if anything, it actually builds confidence because when we make it a goal, now people are more active. We use Slack to communicate. People are so active on Slack now. And then they're cheering one another on. And even if they failed at something the first time and then they try again and then they win, it feels so good, right? So yes, I, I encourage everybody to make failure a goal. Yeah. I, it's so weird when you hear, when you said that people are like cheering each other on when they go and they fail, because it kind of sounds counterintuitive. Like, oh yeah, you didn't make it, but I'm <laughs> proud of you. But it's so true. It's so true. Like I know uh, we earlier you were talking about how you did so many things that didn't pan out before you got to where you are now uh, with Curse Driven Athena. I know Andrew hates the term overnight success. Ooh, yeah. Hate that term. Because hate that, that term. is so rarely the case. Mm-hmm. Like, we often just show our successes and the highlights of our life. Like, Instagram, in many ways, is kind of like a highlight reel. But we rarely ever talk about the failures, the moments where we feel down, and all of the work that got to what you see now. And so... I remember I listened to one of your uh, podcast episodes, shout out to the Chinguana Revolution, uh, where you actually talked about the failure challenge that you had with your clients and hearing about all of your clients and the risks they took. And I remember one testimonial or one story you had uh, from a client where they're like, I'm so happy that I am not going to go through a life going, oh, well, instead of what if. What if I went and did this? And that really stayed with me. I think it was like walking by the lake when I re- when I heard this episode, and I was just like, "Damn, put that on a shirt," you know, <laughs> because that is yeah. so true. That is so true. Um, and many people will go through life thinking that way because they are so scared of the F word. What happens if I fail? But if you fail, like you said, Erica, now you know. Now you know more. You can go and tackle it again but with more knowledge than what you had before. And I think it's that's the most important thing for people to learn and to know about. Yeah. Yeah, I I I think that when it comes to to failure, failure I find at least is the a better teacher than success could ever be, you know? Yeah. And I think that that if if more people were not afraid to fail at this, fail at that, or or maybe they were on one path and then one day they wake up and they realize, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore. And they think, oh, okay, but then I just like waste, you know, the past, you know, how many years of my life? And it's like, no, you you stuck to a path. You learned a lot of, about yourself through that process. And then you found out one day that this just wasn't serving you anymore. And I've seen that happen too, where people think, oh, I'm on this path for five, six years. I have to stay on this path for the rest of my life. And I've seen a lot of people who halfway through their careers are just like, okay, you know what, I'm going to go you know, do this now. I was in public relations, but now I really feel compelled to like open a plant shop or a cafe. And yeah. it's like that, but that doesn't mean the first half of their life was a failure. It's just, they feel called to something else. They learn about themselves and now this is the new path that they see for themselves. Yeah. And I just want to add, um, I know that when you first took this leap, your mom, I think you mentioned in one of your podcast episodes, your mom was very like, whoa, what the hell, Erica? Why'd you do this? Why'd you leave this comfy tech job? To now go start this, but it's because 
they didn't know that this could be a viable thing. They didn't know something like this could could be an option. And I know that over time, you talked about in that one episode that like your mom started to become more on board and supportive with you in this idea. Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of us wait until we are validated from the people who love us to take the action. But people aren't seeing your vision. Like the vision is for you, not for them. And I've used the analogy before of like prescription glasses where, you know, if all three of us shuffled around prescription glasses, we wouldn't be able to see from each other's prescription. And that's kind of how visions work and your purpose works. And my mom was afraid because she's, I mean, she still cleans houses to this day. And she always knew if she needed financial support, she could rely on me. But now I was walking away from what she considered stability. So it made her feel very uncomfortable. And it also, you know, my mom worked really hard for me to have that quote unquote stability. And I say that in air quotes because the tech industry has had massive layoffs, right? Massive layoffs. So like nothing is secure. If anything, you starting your own business is probably the more sec most secure thing because that's that's the most in your control, right? Like you decide how much you work. Uh, so yeah. And then um, Andrew was mentioning about uh, like if you had a previous job, but like and it's not a waste of time. It's not. If I didn't work in tech all those years and worked in all those departments, there's no way I'd be running a business the way that I'm running one right now. Yeah. My knowledge of tech, my knowledge of marketing, my knowledge of sales and partnerships and all of these different things has have supported me so, so much. And then the worthiness thing, because you all touched, you both touched on so, such amazing things. But yeah, so I took my mom to a restaurant in San Diego and she was like, no man trayendo a estos lugares. Like, don't bring me to these places because she <laughs> felt like it was too nice. I then kept, I continued to take my mom to these nice, nice places. And she slowly but surely started to feel as if she belonged there. And even as something as simple as Trader Joe's, she used to feel that Trader Joe's was for wealthy people. And now she's like, I feel like Trader Joe's is my home now. I was like, okay, good, mom. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's crazy how we can feel so unworthy of things. And the whole time that I worked at, in tech, I remember I would go on these trips and I felt like I didn't belong there. And it, it's like, whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. Like that saying, it's also whether you think you're worthy or not, you're right. Like I, I it's you get to decide if you're worthy or not. And everybody is inherently worthy. Yeah. He's yeah, down. everyone is inherently worthy. And and that that is it can be such a hard thing to believe sometimes that like I deserve to take up space. I deserve to be in this room. Cause even with us, you know, being in in you know, movies and entertainment and all that, it can be very tricky. I remember like for the first maybe five, six years that we were doing this stuff, we thought like, oh, do we do we actually belong in this room or we just get lucky? Did we just get lucky? You know, did we just, you know, happen to find ourselves in the right place at the right time? Which I do believe like part of that is still true, but it's like, I feel when you're prepared to meet that opportunity, when you have the skills to meet that opportunity, like you, you do belong in that space. Um, and there is an element of, of luck involved, but when you have the skill set to, to meet that, um, you know, that that's how you kind of things can take off. And I know our, our dad did not, believe in us right away from when you wanted to do film. He was very like, oh, be a lawyer, be a doctor, be an engineer. And and now I see, you know, he grew up very much with a scarcity mindset because he grew up pretty much like right above the poverty line. And so I know he was coming from a good place, but we really had to like do our work to prove otherwise for him that we did deserve to to be in this stuff. And and like you said, Erica, it's it's often said until you place your parents in these environments that they see, oh, wait, this actually is possible. You know, I can be in these restaurants or make Trader Joe's my home. <laughs> <laughs> like you, you both sharing your thoughts just now made me think that like when we're kids, like we're told, go for your dreams, chase what sets your, your soul on fire. And then when you're an adult, now you're told you have to be realistic. Mm. Now you're told, oh, that's not possible, which in many ways is just whoever's saying that, them placing what they think of themselves on you in terms of if I can't do it, you can, which I know might be some of the unconscious thinking that maybe our dad had when we first told him that we wanted to go into film, uh, mm -hmm. but it's so true. And I just like you both share your thoughts and made me think of that, that like once you grow up, that like sense of like childlike wonder and excitement and curiosity just 
goes away because now you have to get a nine to five job. Now you have to stay for retirement. Now you have to buy a house, insurance, insurance, oh. the whole thing. Yeah. And so it's just like, wow. I, I'm like, I wonder like at what age does that start where you have to start thinking like that? <laughs> and like, yeah, I know we're getting a little deep here, but hey, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it's so true. Um, but with that said, one of the things that I know helped lead your transformation was also the power of social media, uh, particularly with TikTok, um, because I know with social media, there are pros and there's definitely a lot of cons too, but with you, there are a lot of pros in which it helped you interview folks like Louis Fonsi, it helped you grow your coaching business. And so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about TikTok, what led you to start using TikTok and what what grew from that? Yeah, I feel like that in itself is evidence that realistic is just an opinion and everybody has a different opinion. But, you know, it, I would have never thought, oh, yeah, I'm going to go interview one of the top Latin artists when I didn't even have a podcast at the time. Like it, it really came out of nowhere. So TikTok, um, actually an ex-boyfriend <laughs> told me that I should go on TikTok. And I opened the app and of course I saw all the trending stuff, which at the time was like all these teenage girls. And I was like, this is not my vibe. Like this is, I am not looking for attention from guys. I'm trying to, you know, give people valuable information. And then I, I realized, well, the algorithm doesn't even really know me. So it's just showing me all the trending stuff, which was comedy and women. So uh, and kids doing dances, right? So I deleted the app and then I downloaded it again, again a few months later. And this was in December of 2019. And I gave it a little bit more time and I, I started, there was so much talk about TikTok uh, being for kids. So then I think my first viral video was me as a 29 year old uh, on TikTok and how I didn't belong there. Like somebody teach me what to do on here because I feel out of place. And that video ended up getting me like 2000 followers, which like we know that I know it's crazy on Instagram. We would take years for that. Wow. And I was like, OK, well, there's something here. And there was one thing I knew. So I had mentioned earlier that um, and Andrew had mentioned this as well, how our previous experience helps. I, I knew one thing from working in tech, and that was the early adopters have an advantage. So that is why I gave TikTok a try, even though I was resistant to it. And then I started posting content about yoga because I was I had just finished yoga teacher training and those videos didn't do that well. Like they didn't really pick up. But then the pandemic happened. And when the pandemic happened, uh, I started to actually right before the pandemic happened, I think I posted one video about imposter syndrome working in the tech industry and how it felt as a woman in tech. And that video also went viral. So I was like, OK, I can do this. Like, I love talking about this stuff. And through yoga teacher training, you don't just learn flow. You also learn ethics, yoga ethics. You also learn mindfulness. You also learn all of these different things. We also read the book, The Four Agreements, through yoga teacher training. So I was deep into the self-development world after calling off my engagement. I went really deep into who am I? What do I want? What do I value? So there was a lot of info for me to share at that point because of all the research I had done the previous five years. So then the pandemic happens and then my account goes from no followers to or from those 2000 followers to like 5000 followers and I'll never forget I went from 12000 followers to 25000 followers in a day because I had a few videos go viral but it was just like there were so many people coming to the app and not that many creators so that's why my account grew so much mind you people were also at home with nothing to do then TikTok reached out and was like, hey, we are creating this program called Learn on TikTok. Are you interested in joining? And I was like, sure. So then that is what held me accountable to create informational content. And I was like, well, I, I love creating informational content. This is something that does feel aligned for me. So I started talking about how um, sharing my morning routine, how to build habits, uh, how to overcome imposter syndrome, um, what else did I talk about? Mindfulness, like how to start a vision board. I mean, I, all that kind of stuff. And then I started to host these workshops. They were just free workshops. And the first one was how to stay motivated during the pandemic, because a lot of people were losing motivation because we were all struggling with our mental health, which makes total sense. And then I did another workshop on how to overcome imposter syndrome. And then I did one more 
on uh, how to grow your personal brand or business on TikTok. Wow. And at every workshop, people asked me, Erica, do you do one-on-one -on -one coaching? And I was like, what the fuck is one-on-one -on -one coaching? I was like, <laughs> this. I had no idea what that was. And then that's when I came across the program that we all met in. And when I joined as a student, I was like, it was our second week and we talked about mindset and we went through that like Byron Katie worksheet. And I was like, this is what I'm going to help Latinas with. And like in that moment, I just knew like it just took all of those different things for me to leave me there. And that's how my business kicked off. And then my my TikTok at that point, I probably had like 40,000 followers, I believe. And at that point, I had a very specific it was like I was very broad. And then after that clarity, I had a specific intention for the page. So I started creating content on culturally what it was like to feel imposter syndrome and what it was like to live with your immigrant mom because I had just moved back in. And that content really started to take off. And that's how I launched Purpose Driven Latina at the time. And I remember that that video went a little viral. So I ended up getting 120 applications. Of course, half the people thought it was like free. And uh, <laughs> I mean, it, I ended up selling out the program, but it was also a fraction of the price of what it is now. And I went through so many calls. I mean, I've just learned so much. I did all the wrong things, but that's how you learn. And then uh, after that first enrollment of, of Purpose Driven Latina, I got an email from my TikTok manager because they had given me a, a TikTok creator manager because I was a part of that program. And they asked me, hey, like, would you be interested in participating in Hispanic Heritage Month? And I was like, yeah, of course. And they were like, great, we're going to, you know, it's confidential. Like, we'll send you more info later. And I was like, okay, great. And then I get this email that it's like interviewing Luis Fonsi, confidential, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, hmm, yeah, right. Like, they're not going to make me do that. Or like, they're not going <laughs> to let me do that. It's going to be a panel or something. And maybe it's going to be private. And then they're going to edit it and post it. Nope. It was me and Luis Fonsi on TikTok Live. And there he was. And I was like, they literally didn't even like they I was I didn't I didn't interview for this. They didn't vet me. How do they know I'm not going to fuck it up? Like it was just. <laughs> so oh, wow. Much all of a sudden. But I didn't even believe that it was true. I didn't believe it was true until they emailed me with the graphic. And I was like, oh, this is actually happening. But I, it, I really didn't believe it. And that's how unrealistic this actually was. So it's just great evidence that never limit yourself based on what you think is real because we don't know what's real like who would have known that all of these different things would have happened to put me in that place where then I interview Luis Fonsi and if you all don't know who he is he's the guy who sings this Despacito mm -hmm. yep yeah oh my gosh that's incredible <laughs> so like well I just I just kind of uh, to reflect on that for a moment when you were interviewing Luis Fonsi like did the shock hit you like during the interview? Did it hit you after? Was it both? Like, I can only imagine how that must have been where you thought, oh, okay, I'm gonna like have people with me. It's gonna be edited. And then you're just like on TikTok live with Louis Fonsi and it's just you two in a room chatting. Like, yeah. what, what was that yeah. like? Yeah, so the night before when they sent me the graphic, that's when it all really sunk in. I don't know if I even slept the night before because at that point I went crazy with doing research on him because I knew nothing about him. <laughs> And I asked him, like, and I, I was proud of the questions I asked him as well, because, you know, having such a big hit like this Despacito, my question was, how do you get yourself to continue to create after such a big hit? Because what happens to creators is once they have such a viral video, they want everything to go viral and not everything is going to go viral. It's also with bestselling authors. They write a bestselling novel and sometimes they don't write anything after because they're like, what if it's not as good as that? So I, I asked questions like that. And it was good. I think my internet connection wasn't that great because I was in Mexico at the time. I don't know if you all remember. My mom was building a house, so I moved. Yes, there yes, yes, yes. And I, 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 there was kind of a dead zone in my room, so it was delayed, which was unfortunate. But people got photos and videos for me. And once I was there, I was like, my, I mean, I was terrified. Yeah. But I, you know, speaking of courage, like that's a perfect example of I was terrified. I had all the thoughts. I was like, what if I mess this up? What if people judge me? I'm on what felt like national TV. What, you know, I wasn't on national TV, but this was 2020. So there were so many people watching. And I ended up getting a ton of followers after that. And that's what ended up helping me get to 200K followers. Wow. Wow. That's, that's incredible. incredible. Yeah. 
We were really about to say that's incredible at the same time. <laughs> like, with twins, it's your own sound, you know? <laughs> yeah, but like, I remember two things in particular stood out to me for with the promo that you just said. The first thing was uh, consistency. Mm. Because I feel like so many people, when they start something, they get like 10 episodes in, 20 in, and then they stop. I, I think I read somewhere that like you have to get to at least 100 of whatever it is you're doing before you can start to see more viewership results from from what you're doing. So consistency, that really resonated with me. The second idea uh, was accountability. Having somebody to help hold you accountable. In your case, it was TikTok. Literally, giving you the opportunity, opportunity to be a part of Grow with TikTok. And that kind of helped you with creating your content and staying consistent with that. So those two ideas really stood out to me with with what you shared in terms of starting on social media, sticking with it, and then everything that came after that as a result. And so that's that's very important. That could be applicable to about anything, really. Just as long as you have consistency and accountability, that can really, really take you take you far. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and for folks who are trying to like build personal brands and trying to like, you know, engage with social media, I know that for a lot of people, it, it can be very, um, social media can seem like this really mystical place as to like, how do I even get started? How do I grow a brand? How do I do something that I can feel I can like truly stick with? So are there any sort of like tips or, or, or tricks that, that you have for folks who are just, they're, they're seeing this, you know, behemoth that is like TikTok or Instagram and they're trying to figure like, how, how, how do I get started? How do I start, you know, you know, getting, you know, to the top of this mountain. Yeah. So uh, what I will say is that while TikTok was great for launching my business, the majority of my clients actually come from Instagram now. And mm. Instagram has much less followers than, than TikTok. So I don't want anybody out there to believe that you need a massive amount of followers in order to build a personal brand or positively impact people or to grow a business. You don't need a lot. You just need one client. That's it. One client to start a business. So, or one customer, right? Depending on, on what type of business you're in. And I think that the first thing, I actually have a social media workshop inside of my group program, Courage Driven Latina. And the first thing I talk about, like the five steps. And the first step is managing your thoughts around social media. So you have a lot of people who are like, oh yeah, I want to like build a brand, but like, oh, social media is so toxic. And then I don't want to have to like show my face and it's just so not the place that I want to be. And it's like if you or social media is so hard or social media is not for me. But if you're thinking that you're going to take the actions that align with that. Right. And you're going to continue to find evidence of why social media is is not a good place for you to spend your time. But how are you expecting to grow someplace that you resent or that you have negative feelings towards? So I think the first thing is check your thoughts and your attitude about whatever platform. Because, yeah, there are a lot of people on Instagram who are probably causing harm, but there's also a lot of people who are really helping change lives. Like, I've learned a lot from people through social media. So I think the first thing is, what's the intention behind you showing up? Is it because you are looking to serve a community? And if so, well, get your thoughts out of this platform, get your thoughts, negative thoughts about this platform out of the focus and focus on the people that you're looking to help transform. Um, the second thing that like really just holds people back is they are afraid of being seen. And I get it. Like even I was afraid of being seen, which is why I started off with the food blog and was taking photos of food, not of myself. And it, whenever stories came out, I slowly but surely started to show up on stories. And I mean, it was a very gradual thing for me. It's not like I just started to create content about self-development from day to night, night to day. Uh, it was it was a progress for me. And I just want to validate that it is it is scary to show up and to show your face. But if you are looking to build a movement or build a brand, that's kind of necessary. People would not pay me thousands of dollars on the Internet without ever meeting me in person if I wasn't showing up consistently. Right. To Adrian's point, if I wasn't showing up consistently and showing my face, people feel like they know me. And some of the b biggest compliments I've gotten whenever I get on console calls is that people say, wow, you're the same person that I see online. And I'm like, yeah, I can't be anyone else. Right. <laughs> but sometimes we try to to put on we, we try to show up 
in a way that we think people want to see us. But people don't want perfect. People want realness. That's why TikTok took off so much because people started showing up very authentically on TikTok. And that's why Instagram got so much hate because it was like Instagram was this curated, um, you know, feed. But authenticity sells because people are going to buy from those who they know, they like, and they trust. So that's what social media allows you to do. And the other thing is social media is free marketing. So many companies are out there spending money on ads, on commercials. Social media is free. And it is an opportunity for you to be creative and to reach people globally. Our parents never had this opportunity, right? This is it's it's like leveling the playing field for people that are in film, for example. Like yeah. go to social media and and create there. It's not like you have to be uh, well connected in order to make it in different in different industries. Like social media has opened the doors for so many people. I mean, there's. I'm not well connected at all, but I've been at the airport and people have been like, are you Erica? And they recognize me through social media. Yeah. It, That's that happened so at a cool. Beyonce concert, at an airport, at a restaurant. Like I've had multiple people recognize me and I don't even have a massive following, but that would have never happened if I was alive 20, like if I, you know, was at this stage in my life 50 years ago because we didn't have social media. So as much as, yeah, social media can be can be harmful sometimes for, for children with them comparing themselves and it just like comparison in general, it can also be used in a really positive way. So if you're looking to build a brand, the first few steps would be really bring awareness to how you feel about social media, uh, bring awareness to any fears about showing your face and have clarity on why it is that you want to show up. Mm. Ooh, Ooh, so many good tidbits of right. There. So many good. Seriously. Also, how badass is that that you got recognized at a Beyonce concert? I'm just saying, like that. That ooh, like, like okay, you're here for Queen B, but you also recognize me, like, right? You're here for Queen okay. B, but you're also here for Queen E. Hey, <laughs> Queen E. <laughs> I love the ass. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Oh my God! Here for that. Yeah. Did you just come up with that. I did just come up with that on the spot. That was not. Genius. Yeah. Genius, Adrian. Thank you. Genius. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, but yeah, I mean that's that was all just incredible. Uh, especially with the importance of talking of you talking about showing up on social media because, mm -hmm. like you said, in many ways it is free marketing. You know, it doesn't cost anything to open up an Instagram account or a TikTok account. It just Start one, host, engage with the community, and slowly but surely, the more you show up, the more people will show up for you. You know, people will engage with your content, and if you sell a product or service, they will show up for that as well. Um, so that, yeah, that was really, really good. Yeah, and and I, I think, you know, for a lot of people, they're really scared to show up authentically on social media because they're yeah. so scared of like, oh, well, what if I get a negative comment or I get, you know, a troll or something? And I mean, I can only really speak for my own experience in that once you deal with like your first few haters and your first few trolls, you kiss just kind of like, oh, okay. Like, yeah, you know, they're just words, you know, they're just words from someone who has no idea who you are. Or they have no idea what your life is. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I remember hearing this quote, it's like, you know, if you have a problem with me, you can text me. If you don't know my number, you don't know me well enough to have an opinion on me. Like, and it's like, I think that, that that's that's so true that it's like, you know, you kind of have to be ready to embrace the good and the bad, but so long as you're showing up for yourself authentically, to put it plainly, haters going to hate, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And you're not responsible for the way that other people view you or think of you, right? And I, I think with social media, it's so easy to receive um, comments like that because a lot of times it's anonymous, right? So there's no accountability there. And you also have to think about that. Well, what does that say about that person that they feel comfortable because they're on the other side of of the screen? Um, and what I will say is on TikTok, whenever I would have things go viral, there was always some some. I mean, not everybody's going to agree with you, and that's OK. Everybody's entitled to their own opinion about different things. You could say the most neutral thing to, in your mind. It's probably the most neutral thing. And somebody will find something, a way to twist it or, you know, interpret it in a different way. But. What I have noticed is on Instagram where I have less followers, I mean, I'm out there talking about the four M's for my clients, which is movement, mindfulness, 
uh, mindset and masturbation, right? I'm sure there's some like religious people out there that are extremely triggered, extremely triggered by me talking about masturbation and how it's great for like women to be able to masturbate because it allows them to receive and it removes shame and creativity and sensuality are very connected. But I'm sure people are out there pissed. But at, that, at this point, I think I'm so clear about my brand that I actually don't even get the haters anymore because... I'm just unapologetic about the way that I the way that I talk about it. And actually, yesterday, one of my podcast episodes came out where somebody made a comment um, that I like wasn't my point of view. So we were this this uh, individual is a practicing Christian and my mom's also Christian. I am very spiritual, but I mean, I'm also out here talking about masturbation. Right. So like, you know, <laughs> I don't know. If, I mean, my mom probably wouldn't be happy about that. But um <laughs> So this person talked about how she feels very conflicted with things uh, like certain topics that have happened that have come up recently, for example, Roe v. Wade. And she was saying, like, as a, a woman who's had a miscarriage, she um, has a lot of empathy for, you know, like losing losing children. And then uh, on the other end, she also has a lot of empathy for like the woman who's been raped. And she shared that she quite honestly doesn't know how she feels about the topic. And I know how I feel about the topic, <laughs> right? But it's it's like I'm also not going to make her believe what I believe because people are allowed to have their own opinions. And I think it's almost a form of control. Uh, like, obviously, we'd be voting very differently if we went to the polls because I believe women should have a choice. And like I've even supported a lot of clients who have gone through um like making that decision and there's so much shame and it's not easy and it's like it's not like people are out here like yeah let's go have an abortion like it's a difficult thing regardless but people should be able to have the choice and you know if you're a practicing christian and like for example uh my mom like if she ended up pregnant she's she doesn't even have a womb she can't even she's like 63 she's not gonna get pregnant but anyways if she somehow ended up pregnant <laughs> He's going to have that baby because like those are her those are her her beliefs. And all of this to say that even on my podcast, right, and on my platform, like somebody who I had met, which I never expected that to come up, I had to then make that decision like, shit, do I edit this part out, which kind of feels a little bit unethical because like that's what was said in the interview. And the whole point of this is to allow people to share their opinions. And it wasn't like she was trying to be malicious. She was simply explaining I feel conflicted with this issue so in the end like I ended up just giving a disclaimer at the beginning of the of the episode and like a trigger warning and I was like I just want you to know we talk about this um this doesn't mean that like these are my views and this doesn't mean that we're trying to convince you so it's it's complicated like it things like this do happen and this is like very fresh like this just happened yesterday and then yesterday Mexico freaking uh now approved that like you abortion is legal nationwide in Mexico and I was like wow it's crazy how like the universe works <laughs> like that synchronicity um but I really had to struggle with you know I've invited this person on my podcast do I want to remove the episode because that feels also again like I'm silencing someone I also believe in freedom of speech so like maybe I just give a disclaimer and give my point of view at the beginning and then I let my I can I think the point I'm trying to make is that at some point, you have to let the consumers also think for themselves and come to whatever conclusion they want. And that's ultimately why I didn't remove the podcast episode. But something for you two to also think about, being that this is a new podcast, like sometimes these things will happen, right? And as it would be, and it would be, I think, a dis, um, it wouldn't be valuable for me to just talk to you about the positive stuff of social media if I was yeah. mentioning, like, at some point, you have to make these tough decisions as well. Right? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. You have to take the good and the bad and just try your best to to juggle the two all uh, right to the best of your ability. Yeah. Yeah. No, exactly. Uh as we are nearing the end of the episode, if folks want to keep up with you, where can they find you? Because obviously they know you have a TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh where else can can they find you? Yeah. So my username is the Erica Cruz. That's Erica with the K. And you can find me with that same username on TikTok, on Instagram. I mainly hang out more on Instagram. And then that's also my website. So it's Um, You can find information about uh, all my programs there. Obviously, Courage Driven Athena. I also just recently launched a mastermind called Magnetic Mastermind, which helps women go from 
being in hustle mode to tapping into their feminine energy and growing their business and their career through feminine energy. Uh, so that is new and exciting. And then let's see what else. Oh, and I also have a podcast called Chinguana Revolution. Yes, yes. Uh, I listen to it all the time. I highly, highly recommend it. It's such a great podcast. Uh, Erica covers a multitude of different topics, as well as having a number of awesome guests on her show. So I highly suggest you give it a listen, because God knows I do. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, But fantastic, fantastic. Erica, thank you again so, so much for coming on the show and being our inaugural guest we we're so honored to have you. And please, if you're ever in Chicago, let us know. Yeah, it's we'll always you. always such a pleasure to share space with you yes. and to be able to chat with you. Um, yeah, you just have such great energy and so many just amazing thoughts to share. So we thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for tuning in to Transformation Talks. We hope this podcast has brought you insightful conversations, laughter, and a deeper understanding of the human experience. If you enjoyed this podcast, please consider leaving a review and sharing it with your friends family, and fellow truth seekers. Remember, it's okay to be real, to be imperfect, and to navigate the messy and beautiful journey of life. So thank you for joining us on this incredible journey. And until next time, remember that you have the power to transform your world. Thanks again, everybody. We'll talk to you again soon. Take care, everybody. Mm -hmm.